Greetings my friends and welcome to a brand new nation's guide and today we're going to be looking at Courland. Now we're obviously going to be looking at uh, what we start off with, uh, what our future plans might be, our enemies, our allies, uh, any future sort of tactical and strategic advice and where we might be able to expand and we'll look at in terms of maybe lands you can potentially look to take to expand the empire, the Courland Empire, and also looking at trade and all the other things in between. We're really trying to get a sort of a rounded look at what it's like to be Courland. Now, as you can see with Courland, you do start off with, with one region, but my goodness, that region really is sandwiched in between very, very powerful empires, very well established empires indeed. So you're going to be looking at, if you're not know, looking too far, to be looking at where your potential allies and indeed where your enemies are going to be coming from. But let's, let's, let's first look at where you start with. Let's look at what we, you start with and that way then we can sort of build for that, our picture out from there. So you can see Courland here is sort of sandwiched between Lithuania which is a Polish territory here and Riga which is currently is Swedish t territory. So again you're already sort of you're already options in terms of your t t uh, sort of where you want to expand to are limited but you do have thankfully the ability to move out through the Baltic Sea however you do not start with a, f with a port at all there's no port here the only port you got here is like ah, yeah, I think I've said that right please again excuse any of my pronunciations my friends they are going to be horrific so I can apologize in advance as you can see here we've got this harbor village here which will eventually turn into a port but that that's a, that's a long way off. If I'm not mistaken, that's going to be a long way off. So there's no villages growing at the moment. So that's going to be a very long way off, unless you capture a region with one already there. Now, let's, as I say, let's have a first look we start off with. So you've got here uh, Kuldiga, which again is a craft workshop, and actually well established already. You could probably move down to Iron Workshop. Now you start off with a craft workshop, you're going to bring in 500 regional wealth, plus 6 to, per turn to town wealth in the region. Not bad start at all. And also you've got iron workshops, give you 750 to regional wealth, plus 8 per turn to town wealth as well. And also an Oxy's uh, research abilities as well, measuring tools, coke blast furnace and basic steam pump. And you've also got here the Prieli farmlands as well. I believe, yes they are, the peasant farms at the moment, upgraded with tenant farms with the common land ex ex enclosures uh, research. You've already got, as you can see, research, uh, trade coming in here. You also start off here with a military governor's barracks, or encampment, should I say. And that gives you the ability to, to recruit militia, provincial cavalry, and regiment, and regiment cavalry as well. Regiment of horse, plus three to bonus attacks income, and plus one to repression. And also, you've only got one capacity here to expand here, your capacity to recruit. But if you were to immediately jump to a minute governor's barracks then immediately you can see you get line infantry you get line infantry uh, you get the standard what you, what you opened up with but this really is crucial here. line infantry really I cannot overstate how important line infantry is and I know militia can, are good at the very start but that really is a huge huge thing to get here is line infantry and again I think the yeah, line infantry is standard to actually 40 uh, that's standard for most line infantry. There are a few exceptions where you get line infantry which are slightly better than that, but that's, that's a rare exception. Um, but line infantry really does form the backbone of any empire's armies. It really, really does. It's the core of them. And again, you're able to 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 create and build uh, 12 pound hoisters, but you've got to get explosive shells for that. And again, 3 pounders here, explosive shells, light infantry, and 12 pounders with canister shot and dragoons as well. So it, does, it, it gives you. A, a, a quite a fair balance there. And you're already, we can actually expand one more, one more building type up as well. So again, you're going to be able to expand the military governor's barracks up another level as well. That'll probably open up additional units to you. Now, for what for the the size of the region, I think this is probably the best possible uh, sort of situation you can be in. Uh, there's already a well-established military sort of pr province in Courland. So it really is important there, because if you had a sort of um, uh, civilian administration, it'd be much, much tougher to get the armies you need, especially given the situation you are in terms of the region. It really is important that you get an army up quickly, because there are going to be m possibly many nations near to you that are going to probably want to swallow up your land as quickly as possible to, f to bring their empire either closer 
or to have a buffer between another empire. So again, you're going to be looking at you being part of sort of the overall tactical sort of plans of a greater empire. So either Poland or Sweden are going to be looking at you for different reasons. You've also got as well here the Tukums Forest logging camp here. What am I bringing in here? 625, that's actually not too bad at all, is it? That's a fair old chunk of change right there, but you can also upgrade here to the lumber mill once you've got the machine tools from technology here. 750, not too bad at all, not too bad at all. But as you can see here, you can see the trade already moving along the road here from Poland. So we've already got a trade agreement with Poland. They're coming here from Dynaberg, which is absolutely wonderful. It really, really is. So that proves now that we have always got an established relationship with Poland. That's good. That's good to have. And also you can notice here we do have a gentleman and a rake as well, a spy. Now the gentleman is useful if we had a school. Now we don't have a school. We could always demolish this to get a school. But I think it's going to be the case where a school is going to have to come from conquest. Now of course we could you could be looking at since you've got the alliance here, actually we can probably check here our diplomatic relations. Now with Poland it's indifferent so everybody is in but Sweden is hostile with us. There is your key component to where your strategic sort of eyes should wander. That's to Sweden. Because straight away everybody else is indifferent. Pretty much everybody doesn't really care about you. That's what it basically means, uh, indifferent. They're not really bothered by you at all. They don't see you as a threat. They don't see you as a strong ally. So they're not really bothered either way whether you exist or not. However, Sweden does have hostile intent towards you. And that could actually put, fall into your hands. It really, really could, because that gives you a pathway into taking and expanding your empire. Now, of course, you've got to be careful. If we, if you were to move into Sweden, this, there's a number of things you've got to be, consider. The first is, if you take Riga, that's absolutely fine, because it not only would give you a, a coaching in here, which you could then demolish and make into a school, ultimately a college and a university etc. It will also give you additional workshop here, a craft workshop and it will also give you a farmland here, peasant farmland and I'm potentially here as well and Pamu another harbour. So the port there could be done and also you've got Riga itself which is an already a fortified city or fortified town as you can see here. The army is quite small game we've only got basic roads in it as well I believe we've only got basic roads as well indeed so as always infrastructure is so important get those get those cobbled roads up as quickly as you possibly can <coughs> as you can see you can, you can recruit plenty of horse but you only get one slot here so upgrading to the barracks is going to be very very important it really really is but we'll have a look at that in more depth later on you've already started with the demi cannon the pikeman and two militia and you've got the general here as well, but no additional horse, which is slightly unusual. And you've already got line infantry here as well, the Swedes. So it's going to be important for potentially you're going to have to sit on what you have at the moment, expand the military governors, military governors, expand your your economy if you possibly can here as well in Koldiga. And then once you've got a, a good army up here, you could possibly move against Riga. Now that would probably be my first. The first place I would look to expand would be Riga. However, I know that then you could possibly be thinking, well, we might move to St. Petersburg here because that's also under Swedish control. However, you've got to consider, my friends, that St. Petersburg is a Russian goal. It is a, a Russian objective. It really, really is. You cannot underestimate how much the Russians want to take St. Petersburg back from the, Swedens, from the Swedes. It really is that important. So if you move against St. Petersburg, you do risk the possibility of Russia eventually, or maybe even sooner than that, looking to take it back from you, unless you have an incredibly powerful force or forces in St. Petersburg, which would enable you to hold off a sustained Russian attack. But you're going to remember, you're going up against probably one of the largest empires in terms of landmass. Now, I know that it can be argued the Russian f army isn't at its peak at the moment. It is not in the doldrums, that would be the wrong use of waste, but it isn't 
as efficient a fighting force as it could be given the sheer scale of the empire with Moscow being the hub and Moscow of course is very very close <coughs> to St. Petersburg in terms of the rest of the Russia of course it goes always all to the Urals so you have to be careful here that you don't sort of stir up a hornet's nest further down the road for yourself however you could potentially look to get a getting in Sweden on your side for the moment because you can see here Sweden does have an open port here it can, you can trade with Sweden so it might even be the case that you get trade with Sweden to build up your forces build up your land and then you sort of go for Sweden later on down the line when you've got that strong army that you know that can barrel through Riga and take it off them very quickly but again have to have your wits about you my friends because they also have Stockholm, they have Finland, they also have a port here in Visby and they've also got a port here in Malmo now this is going to enable them to of course launch any sort of a naval attack against you landing on the coastal Baltic here in the Baltic Sea and move against Courland or Jelgava or Jelgava itself and that would pretty much wipe you out, that would unhinge everything you've worked for so again, you've got to have your wits about you in this campaign. You simply can't go barring in. Consider what's around you. Consider your enemies. Consider your foes. Again, Poland quite clearly is indifferent to us. Minus two only. But you, I, I'm supposing that could probably be pushed into the positive if you continue trading with them. If you sort of start building up your forces. If you start maybe even help them out. If they move against Sweet or them you might even, you might even, and here it is, you might even be able to move against Konigsberg. Now, I know that some of you might be kept set, so setting your gaze towards Konigsberg as well. A fortified city, a very, very heavily fortified city. Consider this early on, very heavily, heavily fortified. Got incredible expansion opportunities. It really has production here would be astronomical. It really would. The economy would boom with having sort of Konigsberg under your belt. Again, you could turn the coaching in into either a school or additional economic building. And also you've got uh, the Tillicit here as well, which again is always a craft workshop, a weaver. But consider this, it's also a target of Poland. As you can see here, you've got Poland here as well. They'll probably want Konigsberg to solidify its hold here along the, the Baltic here. To sort of really have an iron grip on all these regions here. Alternatively, it's also going to be a goal of the Prussians. The Prussians are going to want to keep it and take back Gdansk and sort of unite Western East and Prussia and sort of this rebuild and put together, back together, the Prussian Empire as it was. That again is very, very possible, a huge possibility here. And again, they're going to have a, yes indeed they have, they've got Rostock here. So if they, they can uh, again launch attacks along the Baltic Sea here to you or def even sending forces to defend Konigsberg, again you have to be aware of what's going around you here because you really are sandwiched between some very strong, very very powerful forces but you're also in a way limited to what you can do. You can't expand massively or quickly. You can only have two trading partners thus far because you don't have a trading port or any port to be honest with you unless you take one and even if you took Konigsberg, there wouldn't be an automatic port there. Memel is not ready. If you took Riga, you're not going to have a port either because the port here is not ready either. Here, in Pamu. Of course, the size of Paint Saintsburg, that would have one. So again, you're going to be looking to building up towards having a port. But in the meantime, your trade is going to be incredibly limited. You could, you could possibly get trade with... Prussia. They're in they're in friendly, but again you can't because all the port all the trade port trade ports are full to capacity. I don't know if there's anyone else. Again, you're very, very limited what you can do. Everybody's indifferent or sort of unfriendly towards you, but nobody really what it basically means is nobody really cares about you. Nobody cares whether you survive or not. This is one way you're gonna have to dig yourself out of this, when you're gonna have to really think long term the, the tactics have to be long term thinking the strategic thinking has to be you know not just five years in advance 10 15 20 years in advance where do you want to be then with call and which direction you're going to go are you going to head towards the west are you going to head further east or are you going to go to sort of northeastern are you going to move down sort of sort of this way here 
and head towards and sort of cut off all of this region here? Or are we going to sort of move down south and maybe even hit Vilnius? But again, you'd be up against a very, very strong Polish Empire. Who wouldn't probably take that? And I, I, are they allied? They're allied with Russia, and they're also allied with Denmark. So again, you'd have problems with Russia. Russia would not sit by and allow an ally to be effectively taken over, and then see their lands threatened, particularly Kiev. So again, you're gonna have to choose your allies very carefully, or don't have ally with anyone. Keep yourself a neutral. Keep out of all the wars if possible. Again, you might even see Denmark again is an ally of. Poland, so you might even see them coming to their aid. But it's about what you can do with what you have. You don't have a port, you don't have a school. So two two options of one of trade and one of research are already taken from you. You could buy research in from other nations if that's possible. But again, let's have a look at the money. So you start with 7,500 gold. It's not a huge amount, especially for what you have. Let's have a look at some depth here, what you're actually bringing in. 452 from tax, 608 from trade, 1650 from other. So this is basically in diplomatic negotiations, protectorates, sort of bribery, that type of thing. You're actually getting more trade than tax. Army upkeep is 820, which is not too bad. No navy, of course not, that's going to happen for a while, and town watch as well. So you're actually getting nearly 2,000 in coming in. You're at war with the Barbary states and the pirates, of course, and you're a trade partner with Poland. That's probably going to stay with that like that for a long time. It really is going to stay with that for a long time. Policies, we've got medium tax levels here. 226 income for both nobility and lower classes. Now, let's have a few ministers. This is important here. As you can see, straight away, Frederick the first Premier, minus 10 diplomatic relations, minus one prestige per turn. Already a problem for you. Your head of state, your monarch, is quite frankly useless. So you're going to be relying on two things. Either you're going to be looking at some kind of revolution or you're going to have to rely on the cabinet to dig you out of the hole you're in. So again, you're looking at the head here. Now, as you can see, the prestige plus, plus, one, plus one prestige is already cancelling out the minus one from your monarch. But plus eight diplomatic relations is just about dealing with the diplomatic problems. That's why you've probably got people indifferent towards you. It's because of because of Frederick the First is dragging down your diplomatic standing with other nations. This gentleman here, Rudolf Freelander, is actually pretty much holding that diplomatic in place. He's the one diplomat that's holding the diplomacy with other nations intact. He's holding it together. Plus turn as well to town wealth. So he's a, a fantastic head of head of state as it were, first lord. Treasury, nothing at all hanging in the treasury. You can see here, you only three star no bonuses to tax, no bonus to growth, and no additional town wealth at all coming in. So again, you're going to be wanting to look to change your treasury. You've got Bon Voyant, plus one to management, already good, pious, and honest as well. So again, he's going to give you plus two to your management here in the treasury. So he's only 38 as well. Who have anybody? You've got harsh reputation, plus one to management, plus one to justice, plus, plus, one, to, plus one to management. So again, he would be good as well. Age 30, uh, Hanke Steinheil. Then you've got Stallholder, so again, he would already be in the running because he's plus one to Met Management for Treasury Administration. He already puts him in a very good position. Pious, Frugal of 50, so, but again, he's got minus, minus two to Management Treasury. So again, they're balancing him out here. You've got plus one, taking away two, he's pretty much, he's, he's down one. You've got plus one to Management and a Jughead as well. Then you've got this gentleman here as well. Honest, plus one to management, status quo. Um, bomb out, plus one to management, tactician as well. So he could either go into the army or he can go into to the treasury. And last but not least, you've got plus one to management here to Ernst zu Stolberg. Yeah, he's not going to be great. He, this gentleman, is not going to be keep this gentleman away from the treasury. Personally, if it's going to be me, I'd probably put Ludwig Weinmann in here. Let's see what that. Let's see what that. Because remember, you're an absolute monarchy, so you can you can move your cabinets around as you see fit. Let's see what he would do. And look at that straight away. Plus two to global tax income. Plus four to bonus of growth and trade. Plus four to town wealth. Absolutely fantastic. Your justice minister is absolutely fantastic. Plus one to repression. Minus nine percent. Need ten percent costs. 
cut in cost to the town watch plus with the maximum repression from bonus from town watch and again your lord of war lord minister of lord minister of war lord minister of war is useless absolutely useless but we got a tactician here this gentleman here heinrich hardman would be absolutely perfect for army so we could swap him out let's see what look at that minus six to recruitment cost plus six to land technology research rate minus six to upkeep cost for all the army units that is a fantastic fantastic lord minister of war absolutely fantastic and again they've got the navy here as well all these is pious you've basically got a religious man in charge of the navy now we don't have a navy at the moment so <clears throat> you could leave this as it is but if you want to set up so when you do have your navy and you've already got a, a really good minister in charge you could a tactician here put this gentleman here Hank Steinheil let's see what he will do look at that already minus two recruitment minus two to upkeep cost plus four to naval research absolutely fantastic this cabinet here effectively nulls and nullifies the monarch it keeps the monarch where he needs to be but underlying that underpinning his sort of his monarchy is a cabinet that is effectively keeping this this empire or this uh, what it will be eventually an empire on its toes keeping it where it needs to be and having that wonderful base from which you can operate from trade again very very small at the moment only with uh poland and again you can't send out ships to the trade and trade hubs either you've got no port this is the problem see so you're going to be looking to to build up your army as quickly as possible you're going to have to take things by force you're going to have to take uh, countries regions by force now if you went for sweden they've got no allies they've got no protectorates the trade partners of Great Britain and France, they would probably be slightly miffed that you've taken their trade away from them. But you could take Riga and link and already establish yourself as, uh, as control of this part of the Baltic sort of coast as it were. But beware of what comes in from St. Petersburg, beware of what comes in from Stockholm as well. So again, you've got your army here, you can always you can keep your armies close to the capital as well. So if you were in Riga, you could defend the capital, and if you were in Courland, you could defend Estonia and uh, Livonia as well because it's so close to each other. Look, you see, they're pretty much in touching distance. So that's the, that's the beauty of having such a close proximity. If you were to take Riga, you would be able to defend both of them almost at the same time, even with one army. That would be the beauty of that. And again, it would incre include, it increase, what was it, 470 from here. But I believe, oh, they have minus three here. Minus three to town growth. Wow. The lower taxes I thinks to help that out there but that Riga could be turned into quite the quite the base of operations especially if you've got the infrastructure going it would then increase your trade with Poland as well because it'd be feeding across across the river here and it would you'd be effectively having two regions to feed into this trade you have with Poland 